Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third of EMR's webinars about our transformation to net zero carbon. I'm Roger Morton, Managing Director for Innovation at EMR. Our first two webinars were about logistics and about operations, how we're reducing our carbon impact in those two uh, areas of our operations. Today in our final uh, webinar in the series is about how we're working with our customers and our suppliers about reducing our carbon emissions together from our whole operations. I'm joined today by three, three well, real experts from our business, Ian Shepherd, Wayne Hill and Steve Barron. Uh, they'll be introducing themselves shortly and then we have they've each done a video explaining what they're doing in their part of the business to reduce our carbon emissions. And at the end, there'll be an opportunity for you to put your questions to the panel uh, and I'll get them to answer them for you. You can put your questions in the comments bar on, on the bottom or the side of the screen at uh, any point during the session. So from now, uh, right through the videos to when we're having the Q&A session. So please do put any questions you fancy on there about our net zero transition and we'll do our best to, to answer them. So uh, before we go ahead with the presentations, I'll get my co colleagues to introduce themselves. So first, uh, Ian Shepherd, introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name's Ian Shepherd. I'm the Managing Director of the UK Metal Recycling Business, which comprises around 70 sites. Thanks, Ian. And Wayne, nice to introduce. Good morning, everyone. My name's Wayne Hill. I'm the Commercial Sector Head for our UK Stockholder and Profiling Division. We deal with around 350 stockholders across the UK. The stockholders can manufacture anything from a, an RSG going into a school or building right through to complex parts for the automotive industry. That's great. Thanks, Wayne. And Steve, like to introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Steve Barham. I'm the Regional Director for the Southern Region, which consists of 37 locations. Uh, a varied set of locations from small feeder sites through to shearing, baling, granulation, shredding, and also deep sea operations. That's great. So we've got a real spread in the business there. Uh, if you uh, don't remember, don't forget to put your questions into the uh, comments bar on the screen as, as the uh, videos proceed. And then I'll ask those questions to the panel at the end. So uh, uh, enjoy the presentations and we'll see you in about 20 minutes time. Hello. At EMR, we're hoping that COP26 starts the beginning of a truly global reduction of carbon emissions and a deeper respect for biodiversity around the world. The next few weeks will undoubtedly highlight the strong leadership required if we're to make the substantial changes needed to deal with the climate crisis. And while the headlines will be dominated by the decisions made by the governments, the responsibility to change also sits with all businesses operating in every industry. Last year, we made a number of bold commitments to transform our business into a net zero recycler of metals, plastics and other materials by 2040. To make this happen, we launched our Decade of Action. This is a roadmap for the next 10 years that will see EMR switch to 100% renewable power, invest in electric vehicles wherever possible and drive at least a 10% improvement in energy productivity across the business. We know there's more we can do, and despite some challenges and the need for further innovation, such as the need to decarbonize our shipping and transition to electric LGVs, we're embracing the changes that we can make today and make an immediate impact. For us, becoming a net zero carbon business is a 20 year commitment, and that relies on our actions over the next decade to get us started on that journey. The targets in our decade of action strategy have been set with the backing of the science-based targets initiative and the climate group and this means that leading climate scientists support and validate what EMR are doing so I'm keen to let you know how we're doing a year on from the launch globally EMR has made huge steps towards switching to renewable power by working with our energy suppliers we've ensured that 95% of the electricity we use in the UK now comes from renewable sources. In the EU, this figure is 90% and for the US, it's around 35% so far. We've also spent this year investing in energy monitoring technology, 
meaning we're now able to better understand how we use electricity and where efficiencies can be made. And this is a central first step in achieving our goal on energy productivity. It's also really great to see that many more of our employees have started driving electric vehicles, joining millions of other drivers around the world and transforming the carbon impact of our road travel. The last 18 months have been a period like no other and the pandemic has had a huge impact on our operations. Even in these difficult times, opportunities to reduce our carbon impact have emerged. As more of our employees have worked from home, we've realised that we can each be more productive and cut our emissions simultaneously thanks to remote working. Collectively, these actions have meant in the first year of our decade of action, EMR have already started to reduce our Scope 1 and Scope 2 carbon emissions. So far, the transition to renewable UK electricity supplies has alone saved around 17,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide from our annual Scope 2 emissions. And we're investing in better data capture to ensure that each of the commitments we've signed up to can be checked and certified. The past year has also given us an opportunity to look ahead to how we can tackle some of the longer term challenges as well. First and foremost, this is about building partnerships with other businesses throughout our supply chain. To be a true net zero business by 2040, EMR must ensure the materials we buy are both produced and subsequently used in ways that are also net zero. These are our scope three emissions. In 2020, EMR launched Recovers, a partnership with the government's advanced propulsion center, some of the world's leading car manufacturers, Warwick University and others to help create a circular supply chain for the recycling and reuse of electric vehicle batteries. Another project, REAP, is enabling EMR to process electric vehicle motors in a way that retains valuable rare earth magnets to be put straight back into the circular economy. Such projects provide manufacturers with resource security and ensure vehicles are designed with their end of life processing in mind. And these initiatives also help them to reach their own net zero goals. EMR teams are also working hard to develop new, high specification grades of recycled metal to feed into the manufacture of green steel, copper and aluminium. The processes involved are complex and expensive to deliver, but by working in partnership with our industry partners, this will ensure that more low carbon metal is produced closer to home with the added benefit that our emissions from shipping will also be cut substantially. This webinar, put together ahead of the vital COP26 summit in Glasgow, is also part of our journey. We're hoping to provide our customers and partners as well as policymakers and general public with insight and advice on the steps they can take to decarbonise in the years ahead. This summit coincides with a time when the world is looking to the UK for leadership in tackling the climate crisis. With our track record of setting and achieving ambitious sustainability targets, EMR sees this as a valuable opportunity to show the world that the recycling industry can be part of the solution to the climate crisis. As a privately owned family company, EMR has decades long track record of investing its profits back into the business and the Shepherd family have one big goal, to leave our business in a stronger position for the next generation. Likewise, we want to make sure that we have played a significant part in ensuring our planet is left in a better position to fight the climate emergency. We will continue to show leadership in decarbonising the whole supply chain and add to the progress we've already made in reaching our commitments made within our Decade of Action Plan. EMR is in a great position to ensure our goals are met. Thank you for listening. Now, over to my colleagues Wayne and Steve who are going to look closer at how we can support your business in reducing its carbon output. As highlighted by Ian, EMR is investing heavily in its logistics and operations to meet our ambitious sustainability goals. There's a lot we can do as a business, both to improve our practices and to lead the recycling industry into a better future. As part of our Decade of Action strategy, we're busy looking at every part of our business for opportunities to cut carbon and safeguard biodiversity. For EMR to complete the job, we will have to go further still. 
I'd like to talk about how we're supporting businesses and working closely with our partners to fully decarbonise the supply chains in which we operate. Our aim is to help create a circular economy with progressive and sophisticated recycling and reuse at its heart. And this isn't about EMR being totally selfless by the way. We know that helping our supply chain partners to reduce their carbon impact through using our products and services will provide good business for all in the long term. As part of the commitment we've made to the Science Based Targets Initiative, we have an initial target to hit net zero internally in our operations and logistics. These are our scope one and scope two emissions. The final piece in the puzzle is decarbonising our entire supply chain. We need to ensure the material we collect and purchase has been delivered with zero emissions and goes on to play a role in the next generation of manufacturing in a way that also delivers net zero carbon emissions. These are our scope three emissions. This is a challenge for every business that has made a science-backed net zero target and means, for example, that Sky Television will have an ultimate responsibility to ensure that not only are its programmes made with zero emissions, but that those watching at home are also doing so in a zero emissions way. For EMR, it means completely transforming our commercial relationships, many of which go back decades. I'd like to discuss what this means in theory before passing on to my colleague Steve, who will explain how we're already delivering it in practice. For decades, EMR has operated like every other business, with a commodified procurement model in which our customers, whether selling us scrap or buying it from us, would look at our prices and our service and make a simple calculation as to whether they wanted to work with EMR or one of our competitors. This has worked well in an industry that is simple, unchanging and fragmented. The world EMR operates in today, however, is innovating fast and coming to terms with climate change, which has created one of the greatest challenges humanity has ever faced. In this world, commodified procurement models are out of date, inefficient and will hold us back from meeting not just our own net zero commitments, but those of our customers. In the years ahead, businesses at every link of the supply chain must collaborate much more closely. At one level, this means designing products to make them easier to recycle at end of life. But it also means ensuring that the materials these manufacturers use are made from where possible, metals and plastics derived from recycled products, removing the need for the extraction of virgin materials around the world. For our part, EMR must ensure that its processes and products fit the bill delivering high specification grades of steel, copper and plastic tailored for the needs of every industry and delivered in a zero carbon way that keeps our end of the bargain. All this will require an integrated supply chain that would have been impossible to imagine just a decade ago. Now it's essential. Getting there will be tough but there are benefits for all from working together to hit our net zero targets to increasing resource security and finding new profit opportunities for every part of the supply chain. For example, those businesses selling material to EMR will see an increase in the value of their waste materials. EMR will in turn be able to sell on more sustainable, greener products at a premium to manufacturers, who can then enjoy the benefits of creating market-leading low-carbon materials or construction materials that are demanded by customers and increasingly by government regulations. So how do we get there? At the heart of tapping into these opportunities and meeting our Scope 3 emissions target will be the strength of the relationships EMR builds with its customers and partners. As Head of EMR's UK Stockholder and Profiling Division, this is a job that I am working hard on for a key part of our business. Stockholders are an essential part of the steel supply chain delivering steel ready to use immediately for the construction, automotive and many other vital industries. We are market leaders in the procurement of scrap material from this sector and because this has been a reliable and valuable part of our business through the years, EMR has never had to develop a holistic strategy for how we can work better for and with this industry. If we're all going to grasp the opportunities ahead, this must change. And this is why I am currently building a UK-wide team to build better relationships across the industry. And the key to this is sustainability and the ways we can assist these businesses and their customers to meet their own net zero targets. From the conversations I am having every day with our customers, one thing is clear, making the supply chain more sustainable is high on the agenda for almost every business. 
This now forms part of the initial conversation when engaging with our customers. And this is because this sector sees its future within a modern, circular economy in the years ahead. In years gone by, these conversations would have usually followed the traditional commoditised procurement model, with the focus being on price. However, we are now seeing more and more businesses, both new and existing, begin to engage with EMR based on our sustainability strategy. They want to know what we are doing and how we can help them create a circular supply chain. This is how businesses work and EMR aims to take the lead in these conversations. As the needs and operations of our stockholding partners shift, the team that I am building will work more closely with these businesses. We realise if we don't put sustainability at the heart of our work, then we're all going to get left behind. And this is just one example. While my focus is on the stockholding sector, EMR is creating new teams for every industry, laying the foundations for partnerships in every supply chain in which we operate. From speaking with my colleagues, I know that there are opportunities across our business that we are only just beginning to tap into. I am now going to pass over to Steve, Director for EMR Southern Region, who will go into more detail about some of the exciting projects and innovations that EMR is developing with our customers already. Thanks Wayne. At EMR we're fortunate to have long-standing relationships with thousands of customers that are already grappling with how to reduce their emissions and how to position their business for the circular economy of the future. That's allowing EMR to invest in innovation with recycling projects happening anywhere in the world. What I'd like to do is explain a little more about a few of them to show how the huge transformation the industry needs to take is not only happening already, but already reaping rewards for EMR and its partners. The first is Recovus, which is the creation of a brand new circular supply chain in the UK for end-of-life vehicle batteries. This collaboration is supported by the UK government's Advanced Propulsion Centre. The supply chain that we are developing with our partners separates batteries into three groups to maximise efficiency and to protect resources wherever possible. First, there's the remanufacturing. If a battery arrives in a state that can be repaired and re-engineered by a manufacturer for the next generation of vehicles, we will remove that battery and send it back to the factory, creating a simple circular economy. If this isn't possible, the next option is reuse. Processing these batteries so they can be used for grid storage or solar panel battery storage. And finally, if this isn't possible, EMR will recycle the batteries in a way that safeguards the many valuable materials that lie inside these units so that we can return them to be made into new batteries. It's a huge investment and if EMR was undertaking this project alone, it quite simply wouldn't be happening. The initial cost would be prohibitive for a project which would only really start to pay off in a decade when large volumes of electric vehicles begin to arrive at our sites. Instead, we're partnering with car makers including Jaguar, Land Rover, BMW and Bentley because it makes business sense for these companies to ensure the supply chain ready for their next generation vehicles in place now. In addition, we're calling on the expertise of the University of Warwick and a group of five UK recycling organisations focused on innovation to find solutions to many of the complex challenges that building this supply chain creates. So when Wayne talks about moving away from the old commoditised procurement model that the recycling industry has operated with for decades, these are the kind of opportunities that will emerge. And this is just one example. EMR is also investing in a partnership with the University of Birmingham and Hypermag Limited to create a supply chain for the recycling of high strength rare earth magnets. Our world is increasingly dependent on electronics, which themselves are increasingly dependent on rare earth materials. These resources are finite and we simply cannot afford to throw them away at the end of life. REAP, or the Rare Earth Extraction from Audio Products, is a project EMR is leading which will enable the UK to significantly reduce its reliance on the mining of virgin materials such as cobalt and nickel. It will initially focus on those magnets found in loudspeakers but will have a range of wider applications. This includes in the recycling of conventional cars where rare earth magnets are used in motors, for seat adjusters and electric windows as well as in future electric cars where rare earths are found in the main drive motors. Extracting the rare earth metals from our end-of-life waste, often called the urban mine, is a sometimes forgotten but essential step towards achieving a circular economy, and EMR and its partners are helping the UK to get there. Both Recovus and REAP are providing solutions to the UK's end-of-life electronic waste, 
but EMR is also collaborating with businesses in a far broader range of industries than this. My background is in the construction industry and I've worked for builders merchant Travis Perkins for 25 years. I know very well how much effort the industry is putting into reducing its emissions and becoming more sustainable and EMR is finding ways it can help here too. There are huge carbon savings to be gained if the construction industry can reuse existing materials in the buildings of the future. So at EMR, we're looking at some of the big warehouses and power stations up for demolition, where we know we will soon be accessing large quantities of materials. There's a huge demand from big developers for whole sections of these existing buildings, such as giant steel girders, which can then be reused, helping them offset the carbon of their upcoming projects. And the potential carbon saving is dramatic. Supplying them with reusable steel creates around 15 kilos of CO2 per tonne, compared to 1.85 tonnes of CO2 for steel that is sent away to be remelted. Providing a low carbon solution to their construction needs also has a monetary value to developers. Again, highlighting the business benefits that transition to a sustainable circular economy has for EMR and its customers. We're already working with developers such as Grosvenor and Multiplex who want to buy our materials while it's still in existing buildings. They may have a project lined up in two years time and by working with EMR they can reserve the capacity. In turn EMR is able to ensure buildings are taken down more carefully so that the materials can be extracted in a condition for reuse. It's yet another example of the more intelligent way the supply chains of the future will need to work and how EMR is already working with its existing partners to get there. Across our business, there are dozens of other projects, all at different stages of development, that point to an exciting future for EMR and its customers and partners. These include producing new grades of ferrous metal to help the steel industry produce zero carbon green steel. We're also developing new processes for recycling plastics at our plastics facility, providing new solutions to the blight of plastic waste. What EMR has learned, however, is that the most effective way of creating a new, sustainable and circular process is by working closely with our customers. Because a future that's better for the planet and good for business is a shared goal for EMR and its customers. We're able to invest and collaborate in new ways to get there. So I hope I've highlighted what's possible and what's already happening at EMR. There's going to be a huge period of change for many industries across the world, but at EMR, we're ready to listen to our customers' challenges share our expertise and to show innovation with new processes that allow the recycling industry and its partners to become part of the solution to the climate crisis. Thank you for listening and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thanks very much to Ian, uh, Wayne and Steve for those presentations. I hope that everyone found those uh, interesting and stimulating. Um, we had lots of questions coming through while those videos have been uh, been showing, so I'll put those to the uh, to the panel. Yeah, welcome back, everyone. Um, first one, maybe for for Wayne. Um, when did you first notice conversations with customers switching from just price to sustainability as well as an important reason to work with EMR? Yeah, so towards the back end of 2020, we started having conversations with some of our key suppliers. Um, some of our key suppliers are obviously looking at their own plans and how they're going to change the way they do things. Uh, they have, obviously have their own carbon net zero targets to meet. And quite rightly, there, they're speaking with the likes of EMR as part of their supply chain to see what we're doing as part of, you know, to, to improve our decade of action. Um, luckily, we, we put plans in place already. The wheels are, are in motion, so it makes those conversations a lot easier. And we're working with the, with the Carbon Trust to now realise those those ambitions. That's great. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Yeah, I've, I've noticed myself a tremendous uh, increase in interest in this topic, really, just in the last 12 to 18 yeah. months. I think it, we're all seeing that. Great, thanks. Um, there's a... Uh, a really interesting question here from Adam, who's saying, how does EMR plan to tackle the ferrous scrap shortages in future? Because we, he's forecasting a huge growth in scrap demand from the steelmakers in the next few years as they start to decarbonise. Um, who'd like to, to answer that one? Is that... I'm happy to answer yeah, that. Go ahead, Steve. It goes back to uh, something called the urban mine. So actually all of the materials that is waste um, and actually there's an opportunity to extract more metal from what from that waste material 
um, to clean the product up, to improve the quality of it. So actually that shortfall that we're seeing with the Ferris could be, could be coming out of that urban mine. Yeah, there's a, so there's a lot we're missing at the moment that we, we could perhaps be going after. Certainly, um, we, and we, we're putting in research and development um, in that field, uh, just trying to um, separate that material uh, to make it um, reusable. That's great. Thanks very much. And, and actually, a follow-up question from Adam that maybe Ian would like to answer. Um, considering the importance of scrap as a feedstock for the future steel industry, uh, do you think, do you, are you expecting the UK and Europe to implement some form of curb on scrap exports? I know there's been some discussion around that. The, there's certainly um, efforts to curb exports in um, in Europe. I, the, the, the trouble so far is that um, UK and European steelmakers in the most part are under-invested under invested compared to their uh, Turkish and Chinese counterparts, but things are changing fast. So we're seeing huge investment now in uh, UK and European steelworks um, transition to hydrogen as a fuel, but also increasingly uh, a deeper collaboration with metal recyclers on product development. You know, how do we make much cleaner products to improve the value and use for the steelmakers? So that's something we've got a huge focus on in EMR at the moment so that we can uh, help the um, help the steelmakers with their green strategy. That's great. So really interesting opportunities developing in this sector for everyone, right from uh, EMR's smallest suppliers to, to our huge steel industry customers. And uh, I, I know myself, it's a, a real big focus area within EMR and, and the commercial opportunity for everyone, and, and uh, one of my colleagues was saying the other day that uh, you know we're currently quite big scrap exporters because that's where the demand is. But as the demand shifts to Europe, it's quite likely that we may in the end become scrap importers through our deep sea terminals just to satisfy that rapidly growing demand. So uh, watch this space; it's certainly a really exciting area. Um, another question that's come through, maybe for Steve. Um, how many years do you think it will take for electric vehicles that you mentioned to be more common as an end-of-life vehicle than traditional petrol and uh, diesel cars reaching end-of-life? Well, we're certainly starting to see that swing now, but I would anticipate every 2035 that we'll start to see that balance shifted. Um, and if you can anticipate that the, the vehicle life of an electric vehicle uh, is anticipated to be five to eight years. Um, you can see that we're going to need to put some further research and development in how to we, we process these electric vehicles. But I would anticipate 2035. For when it crosses over from, from more electric vehicles to... Yeah. Uh, we're able to process, as far as demand is concerned at the moment, we're able to process within our existing uh, facilities. However, the plans are to, um, to put some new technology into existing sites um, over the next few years. That's great. Okay. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, another question coming through um, for, for Wayne. Uh, how big of a challenge do you think it will be, Wayne, to make sure that the material that EMR collects has been delivered with zero emissions? It's, it's a huge challenge. Um, it's one obviously EMR embraces. You know, we're, we're putting a lot of investment into electrifying our, our vehicles. You know, one of the largest portions of energy come from moving materials and processing materials. Um, electrification won't happen overnight. So in the here and now, we're looking at consolidating materials, moving materials in bulk by rail or by short sea terminal. Uh, this reduces our, our carbon footprint dramatically over the, the traditional freight movement by, by wagon or, or, or road. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, and loads more questions coming through, I can see on, on the screen at the moment. Um, one there uh, from a bit earlier on for, for Ian. Um, why is becoming carbon net zero so important to, to EMR? Um, EMR is a family business um, made up of thousands of people who obviously have their extended families and communities. Um, we have a responsibility um, to reverse climate change for our children and uh, future generations. I think the the consequences of not doing that are grave. You know, you're going to see parts of the world um, becoming uninhabitable, um, prone to natural disasters, um, 
migration, hunger, increased conflict. Um, but of course, we also want our, our children and future generations to enjoy the natural world and the, the biodiversity that we've enjoyed in our generation and previous generations. I think it's, it's also important to say that um, it makes good business sense you know, to adopt lean technologies um, and lean techniques uh, inevitably, you know, done well, inevitably leads to greater productivity and, uh, and lower cost. That's great. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, lo lots more questions about, for Steve, about uh, cars. Um, is uh, recycling an electric vehicle harder than a petrol or diesel vehicle, Steve? Well, if you think about the makeup of an electric vehicle, there's less in the electric vehicle. Um, so uh, the actual process itself is is less laborious um, but in reality um, we still need to determine how we can best make the use out of that battery so in answer to the question um, it's a more simplistic process but in some areas it's more complex in particular with the battery i know roger that we're also participating in lots of research and development about what we do with those batteries yeah um, i can maybe add a bit on that the we have a, a project which you mentioned called recovers where we're collaborating with a whole load of other partners in our sector to uh, recycle, uh, to learn how to recycle electric vehicle batteries. And we're also looking at some of the other uh, components like the, uh, the drive motors that contain, <coughs> excuse me, um, near dimium rare earth magnets, which uh, if we just put those in a car shredder, they, they shatter and, and stick to everything and we can't recover those valuable materials. So we need to find a new recycling route for those. And it's really the same with the battery. You know, we, what we do mostly with the cars now is put them in the shredder and, and separate the materials after we've chopped the car up into little bits. You can't do that with a battery or it'll catch fire and you'll lose the, the valuable materials. So it's a very different recycling route. So uh, you're right in saying that the, the products are, or the cars are much simpler. There's a lot less moving parts in them than, and, and they're actually more reliable than conventional vehicles. So they'll probably last quite a long time, as you said. But uh, we're having to develop a completely new way of treating them it, it won't take it's not something you have to do overnight because the volumes aren't growing that fast uh, at end of life there's huge increase in volume placed on the market but they're lasting a long while so as you said it'll be something like 2035 before we start seeing really big numbers coming into our sites but we think long term so that's what we're preparing for at the moment and uh, we're all working together on that aren't we steve thanks Certainly. very much yeah okay um some more questions. Uh, another one for you, Ian, if you don't mind. Um, someone's asked, with people returning to offices and more travel for meetings, how will EMR adapt and keep on cutting emissions? Well, the, the pandemic has um, forced us to look really hard at our business um, and the movement of people and how efficiently we do that. Uh, and we've been lucky enough to adopt some some really good communication platforms which has allowed us to um, cut out wasted journeys unnecessary uh, meetings but of course that's not a complete uh, substitute for face-to-face -face meetings uh, so we're trying to find that healthy balance at the moment um, but i'm encouraged to see the amount of uh, company car users who are now migrating to electric vehicles so much so that we're starting to plan our own internal charging network at the moment so excited about that um, we're also implementing an energy management system so we can measure our fuel and power efficiency and consumption across the business and as we go through that process we'll adopt um, efficiency technology wherever possible and um, I'm also really pleased to say that already 85 percent of our power supplies from renewable sources. Um, so the lot, lots going on there. Thanks very much yeah. indeed, uh, Ian. Uh, and, and great to see uh, so much passion for, for change in the business. Uh, it, it really is uh, something that everyone in EMR is talking about at the moment. Um, just a, a couple more questions, I think, from, from the many that have come in. Um, maybe one for, for Steve or, or perhaps Wayne. Uh, how does EMR catalogue what materials are in an existing building? Do we do that by visual inspection or looking at the original plans? And uh, yeah, how, how do we go about doing that when we're doing 
demolition maybe you Steve? i'm happy to pick that up yes yeah, so we work very closely with the quantity surveyor to determine um what's in what's in the the building itself and obviously um moving forward um will play an instrumental part in the design of the buildings as well as far as um uh, trying to establish what products we can uh uh, and what material goes into them. Um, we're starting to get a lot more feedback from uh, customers at the moment. Um, they're starting to um, show a real interest in what they can um, reuse, um, or in addition to that, what can be recycled. So yeah, work in progress, working very closely with uh, with our customers. And we're certainly, I think Wayne alluded to it earlier on, since the tail end of last year, we're certainly getting a lot more inquiries uh, as far as that's concerned, because this this carbon footprint um, is is very important to our customer base and, and certainly helps with future tender processes in construction as well as to what that carbon footprint is going to look like. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I saw some uh, news recently that uh, developers in London are now having to offset the carbon uh, impact of new buildings and obviously the steel is an important part of that and that's no doubt why they're starting to engage with companies like EMR and the steel, com steel makers themselves much more closely. So a, a really interesting and exciting time that's, that's creating all kinds of opportunity. Um, last one, maybe from, from our, our question. Oh, there's one more here from uh, Mike, I'll ask. Um, maybe one for you, Ian. I think you've sort of covered it already, but maybe just expand on it. Why are UK and Europe not consuming more of our commodities at the moment? Um, is that a, a commercial thing or, or a, a, a technical issue at the moment? Yeah, pr probably repeating myself to some extent, but um, it largely comes down to the fact that um, the UK and European steel makers are currently underinvested, but uh, they are looking at new technologies and uh, hydrogen fuel, and it comes down to um, um, collaboration on product development so they can get the right value in use as well. So as you alluded to earlier, I think it's a good thing that um, you know they've been forced down this path to um, to green their technology and look at the products that they melt, and it's making uh, EMR and others within our industry raise our game on product development as well. That's great. Okay, more positive stuff, and then yeah, maybe one uh, uh, final question here for for Wayne. Um, what well, what can the businesses that that uh, we work with do to increase the green value of the materials they sell to EMR? It's a good question. There's um, there's a lot that businesses can do to, to increase the value. Um, a lot of our energy consumption goes into segregating and making our materials fit for sale, uh, the quality and removing all contaminants. This can now be done at source within our customers um, and we want to collaborate with our customers, engage with them and explain to them and educate on how best to do this at source. Equally, uh, we see a lot of energy used in our transport methods. Um, this can be improved by optimizing the content within skips, maximizing payloads. This in turn reduces number of collections, reduces the, the, the transport on the roads. And as a direct result of that, you know, it uh, lowers our carbon footprint even more, better for the environment, better all around. That's great. Thanks very much. That's a, a nice way to, to end our session today. Uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, questions coming through there, and I, I hope you enjoyed the presentations and, uh, and the rest of the webinar today. I'd um, like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, this webinar and the two previous ones are available to stream on EMR's YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to share them with anyone you think might be interested, because uh, we're you know, keen to showcase how EMR right across the board is very, very serious about this net zero transition and how we would like to be working with all our partners in the supply chain upstream and downstream from us to, to work on that really, really important uh, issue for, the, for our society. I'd like to thank our speakers today, Ian Shepherd, Wayne Hill and Steve Barron for your time and effort putting those uh, sessions together. Really appreciate that. Uh, and thank you to you for, for watching. I'm uh, Roger Morton, and uh, thanks very much for being with us today.